Hey y'all. Hey, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. What's good? Hey, in the building. <laughs> I love it when people are on time. I love when people are on time. How you doing today? Oh, I'm good. Ladies I'm... and gentlemen, I have the privilege and the honor. Good. Can you sit back so I can see you, so people can see you? Because right now I can't really see you. I see, I see you. Yeah. I don't really see you. There you go. There you go. I, yeah, I, I'm here. I am so I am so excited to be here with you tonight, man. I'm telling you, I had another young lady today. It's been a full day, but I was looking forward to this. I have to tell you, no. I am so happy to see you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Travis Cherry. And I wanted huh. to bring him tonight because he is 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 a young man who has been in the music industry a long time. And he's going to yeah. share some information for those of you who are wanting to launch out and branch out from a producer's perspective, from a music producer's perspective. And uh, the young man has done a lot of things. His discography consists of like Jennifer Lopez and Bone Thugs and Harmony and Rick Ross and Keith Sweat and Jennifer Holiday and Keisha Cole and Raheem and oh my God, the list goes on and on and on. And he's been nominated twice as a producer in the Grammy. So before we really, really, really dive into it, I want to first say welcome, Travis. I want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. And I would mm -hmm. love for you to just tell the people a little bit about who is Travis before he became the producer? Who is Travis? <laughs> Where are you from? Tell us a little bit about the background, the little boy growing up. What you thinking mm -hmm. about being a producer? How did it all start? Um, originally from Raleigh, um... Grew up really right in this in the neighborhood um, where St. Augur's at. You know, grew up in, I started out in Workdale, of course, and then, of course, I grew up in Longview as well. Um, <clears throat> actually, the journey to music, I never knew I was going to even do music. I my, my goal was to be a veterinarian. I wanted to run track, and that was it. And probably the, what, that spring before I got ready to graduate high school, I was training um, at Enlo. And I cut through the woods jogging one night and like thought I um, twisted my ankle, but I ended up tearing the ligaments in my ankle. So I had a cast on my ankle for a while, and I ended up linking up with a friend of mine who I always knew used to be in like R&B groups, and we ended up starting an R&B group. And I think that's where, from there, we did our first show that November. And then when I transferred to St. Aug, I think that's when I met you. And, and how old were you then? So you was about eighteen. Yeah, I was a kid. I was like, yeah. So it had to be like probably 19 by the time I got to St. Aug. That was my, my sophomore year in college, yeah. Because I went wow. to Pittsburgh College my freshman year and then came to, uh, to St. Aug. And um, actually, <clears throat> a great man tried to help us out. Um, Alvin John Waples, actually. Um, met him. And what's so crazy, a lot of people don't know, is, you know, through him being a Jehovah's Witness and stuff, he ended up um getting us all the way to almost having a deal with michael jackson's label like wow. alvin john was using his a lot of his connects for us yeah it's a story that i never really tell anybody wow you know but we ended up <clears throat> you know we ended up not doing stuff with him because of just our own reasons and then we moved to atlanta got a deal down here and shoot from there broke out on my own and got my first production deal and haven't looked back since so you were you had a dream. You wanted to go to college. You want to be a veterinarian. You got hurt. And so that speaks to what we tell people all the time, have a plan B, have an alternate mm -hmm. plan. So you did not have all your eggs in one basket. That's mm -hmm. the first thing I heard. That's the first thing. The second thing I heard was association. I heard you say you was around someone who gave you that exposure and turned mm -hmm. you on to music. So those are two very important things that we heard, having a plan B and be careful mm -hmm. about the people that you keep in your circle because oh yeah you know, you're a subtotal of the five people that you are hanging around so oh yeah let's talk about that first time when you realized that you were now going to take this turn to the music career and mm -hmm. you got that first deal how did that go what i mean what what was it what was the deal what was the first deal was it for you to do production or what was it um us as a group um 
like I said, we didn't we didn't do the stuff that we were supposed to do with Alvin John, and then we end up getting down here to Atlanta, and it was a crazy story because <clears throat> right before I moved to Atlanta, um, it's an apartment I had um, over by Pullen Park, and so my neighbor, this girl, um, I, in, I like I started dating her best friend because I would always you know we'd always see each other, always hang out, sit outside our apartments together, and so I would always see her boyfriend whenever he would come over to see her. And so he used to always tell me, yeah, you know, me and my peoples, we got this record label, but you know what I'm saying? We be in Atlanta, though, you know what I'm saying? So I'd be traveling back and forth, blah, 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 blah. He was like, if you ever come to Atlanta, you know, look me up. So I'm like, all right, cool. Wasn't thinking about Atlanta at that time. And so my other friend that I was singing with, like another member of my group, he used to hang out in the clubs a lot. So he also ran into the same person and he was telling him the same thing, but we never like connected the dots and was like, hey, dog, I met this guy. Wow. Nothing, right? <laughs> so, daggone, um, we ended up, we had a little security job, and we went through that hurricane in 96. So, we came to Atlanta for a weekend, kind of was like, eh, okay, this is kind of cool. So, we ended up coming back to Raleigh, took some vacation time, and came back to Atlanta for a week. And when we got down there, that's when the conversation came up. It was like, hey, I know this dude that we should look up. And he was like, yeah, I know this dude. We ended up getting to the place, and we knew the same person, and they offered us a record deal. Wow! So, so we came back, came mm -hmm. back, and packed up our stuff and moved right to Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta seems to be the land of opportunity. A lot of musicians, a lot of artists, they love to go to Atlanta. Uh, talk about that. Is Atlanta mm -hmm. the place to be? Um. Yeah, I would say, especially in the past, yeah. I mean, it, it is, it, to me, yeah, it is to a certain extent. I think a lot of the L.A. ways have started kind of getting, it, permeating the Atlanta music scene. But during that time, it was a family atmosphere. You know, everybody was just getting on. Like, when I first got here, me and Jazzy Faye linked up. That's my brother for life. Like, he was introducing me to people and, you know, took me under his wing. And it was like you, everybody, everybody was somebody somewhere. And everybody was moving together. It was a nice black city so it was like your circle was like how you said your circle yes your circle back then was not filled with people who wanted to do music it would be like i might go out and hang out with a friend of mine who like i knew this dude that was a drug dealer he would drive down from cleveland to party and then i might know somebody that's a doctor and then i might know somebody else you know that works at walmart but all of us would hang together and that, that power and just everybody hanging together everybody knew somebody yeah and so everybody that somebody that you know now or somebody that's famous is just people that we all just came up together like we all came up together and everybody's been proud of each other like so it's execs everything everybody just clung together because it was its own family it wasn't like you could just go down the street and everybody wanted to do music it was just kind of like everybody just wanted to be in atlanta it was a black city it just felt good to be here it was you know it was cutting edge and there was wow. just so just opportunities. Like it was never really just about the music. It was about the just the electricity of being here, you know? So how about now? What would you tell someone right now if they're on the East Coast? Where's the place to go now in 2022? <laughs> um, to be honest, music is so global now. So it's like you gotta go find your fans. So now it's no longer just, you know, well. To, to a certain extent, as an artist, yeah, you can, you can get a lot done inside of the city. So, yeah, inside the city, yeah, you can get a lot done. It's not, it's not that. But now you got to really heavily, heavily promote yourself. It's not, it's not, there's, no long, there's no longer a time for you to just sit around or just feel like you drop something and you're good. Like, you got to go find your fans. You got to go market yourself. You really got to go out there and get, get the people who are going to do business with you. Now, as a producer, what is something that, you have seen people do when they come to you and you turn your head and be like, hmm, no, thank you. Like, what are some of the, the do's and don'ts like that you would tell somebody when they're stepping mm -hmm. into a studio and they want to get that producer to look at their stuff and they want them to listen? Mm -hmm. What are some of the mistakes that you have encountered when people came to you and you knew you were not doing any business with them? Not, um, it's funny because I got, I, I have an experience I'm dealing with right now where somebody kind of feel some way about me with the same question you just asked mainly not knowing not not knowing what to ask number one like don't come to me like we're friends like it's like come to me as somebody who has done business and you want to do business with like I have people that send me dms and they'll be like hey what's good can I send you some music like no I don't even know who you are you know what I'm saying like show me that you've studied like hit me and be like hey man I heard you did this record for this person 
yo, I'm, I'm a fan of that. You know, you know what I'm saying? I've always wanted to at least get a conversation with you. Then I, I'm more receptive to you, you know, but coming to me feeling entitled when you've done nothing, like it means zero to me. And, it, and it's going to be worse when you go to someone else. Like, you, you know, you try to sit in an office with some of these execs. Like, it's like, dude, like people out here to do business. They're not your friend. And so I see that with a lot research. of young, young people. Yeah, so definitely. You've got to know who you're talking to. Do your research. So don't step up in there and not know who you're talking to, what mm -hmm. they've done, where they've been. Tell them mm -hmm. some of the things that you know they have done so they know that you've done your research and now that you have their attention, correct? Yeah, the same thing that you would do if you wanted a job at IBM. You're going to go in there and say, hey, I know that y'all are trying to get in this market. I know that y'all are trying to develop this product. I know you're trying to do Like, you're going to show them that you know about their business. This, the music business is one of those places where everybody wants to be a CEO on day one. Nobody wants to work in the mailroom first. Like I learned first when I got my first production deal, I was the Swiss army knife in the studio. I was the engineer, you know what I'm saying? I helped keep the, the studio clean. I was daggone, you know, like running back and forth to the store for people. When we had artists in the studio, I did everything I could to, you know what I'm saying? Learn and, and, and get the experience I needed, you know? And I, and I wasn't trying to be, the boss i sat back because i was like i wanted i wanted to really learn this i, I was immersing myself in it now and, that's you know the thing. soaking it up and asking questions right soaking it up and oh yeah questions. so who was that first person who was that first person that you got to deal with that you was excited like yes this is like a dream come true um uh this this label they had an office in atlanta they had an office in dc um named uh, it was called dark city records um, the artist was called Section 8 Mob. Um, they ended up giving me a production deal back in 99. And um, I was with them for like two, almost three years. And what happened was the um, <clears throat> they had a deal with Tommy Boy at the time. And they also had a movie they were shopping. Um, you, if you go in Walmart, you can still see it. Um, it's called uh, Guilty by Association. It has Morgan Freeman in it. Okay. So, you know, they, they you know, we had the soundtrack and the actual movie. And so it was always like a time when you were shopping for the deal and different artists were working out of the studio, like Brat was there and a few other people just working out of that studio. So I was always there. So what helped me, what helped me get stronger in that regard with my business was just the fact that they gave me opportunity. You, you know what I'm saying? Like every day my day would consist of, I'd make it to the studio by 11 or 12, clean up, or usually I'd, I'd already have cleaned up from the night before make sure that, you know, the tables and stuff are wiped down, make sure the whole, you know, whole building is wiped down and clean, ready to go for the day. And then from there, they would give me a few hours in the studio on my own to just work on what I wanted to work on. So I would get a chance to work on my own stuff, get, you know what I'm saying, acclimated to the room and how to really be in a studio. And then the rest of my night was working with artists until one, two, three in the morning. Then I go home, sleep, come back the next day, do it all over again. And then, you know, there was times whenever we would travel, you know, I'd help drive, get us, you know, up to D.C., whatever we had to do. And then they had a tour bus. So, you know, they were always, you know, just touring and doing other stuff. So I got immersed in there during that first deal with everything from, you know, with learning now, how to do everything in a label from top to bottom. Yes, yes. Now, also, you said something about an artist. They need to they need to be willing to invest in themselves, right? They have to go out there. They have to get the EP. Mm -hmm. They got to market themselves. When they come, they got to come correct, mm -hmm. right? They have to have something to Definitely. show. And so what about that person who doesn't have nothing to show, but they, they have that, they have it, they have it. What would you say to that well, person? that they have been told they have it. What would you say to that person if they were really going to approach somebody like yourself? Here's the, here's the problem. Everybody feels like they have it. And at this point, we all know somebody that can sing. But the business now is not about your talent as much as about how can they market you. So it's like now you're a figure that also does music versus you being a musician you know, so you have to think now branding from day one, you got to think, how, how am I going to attach myself to someone's brand? Maybe, you know, do your research and say, okay, Coca-Cola doesn't really give people their main brand. So you don't see, you don't see people, a main artist advertising Coca-Cola. Pepsi does. You'll see Cardi B and people like that on Pepsi on their main brand. The only time you see urban people on Coca-Cola's brand, to be honest, is like Sprite. They'll do Sprite, Sprite Remix, Sprite Raspberry, Sprite Air. They'll give you a, that brand, but they won't let you touch their main brand. 
you have to know down the line what what do it what do you want to do so i i ask people all the time especially you know like when i deal with female artists and stuff like that i'm like listen you need to know every brand that you want from your panties to your bra what underwear do you like what clothing do you like what do you like drinking like you need to know everything because all these things need to be able to be attached to you later on down the line wow. and you're going to have to show brand loyalty Wow. And unfortunately, the reality is nobody cares how good you can sing. They just care about how good you can sell a product. So as, a, as an artist coming in the door, I mean, it's great that you have talent, but we're so conditioned now after 20 years of seeing American Idol, we're so conditioned to see people sing the first verse and sing this big second hook and this bridge and then just do this big note and that's it. Nobody cares, no, nobody cares about who can actually sing, sing anymore, you know? because music programs aren't in schools no more. So nobody appreciates the art of music. They don't appreciate the band doing their thing. You know, they just want to be like, oh, I was in the room with them. They want to so be like, I was 10 feet away from them at a show. Wow. So as a new artist, you need to be like, you have to, there's, there's no way to get around not investing in yourself somewhere. If I gave you a beat for free, you're going to still have to spend money to get it out there. You're going to pay money to to market it in some way you know like like there's no way to get around not investing in yourself and that's what that's what people are blinded to like they think it just happens and it doesn't just happen so i i i was thinking what you said so image let's talk about image so right now in this day and age people are so unique you know mm -hmm. back in the day um uh, the lyrics were different. Now that is anything goes. Let's talk about mm -hmm. that. Is, is it is it something that people need to stay away from when they're out there and they're creating their own image and they're coming out to be authentic? You know, it, they got to go back to um, huh? Um, well, um, that person that just left that comment. Well, Gina, um, if you want a publishing deal. At the end of the day, you you gotta. It's just like it's just like trying to go after getting a manager. You can't go get a manager unless you have something to manage. Most publishers are not sitting around now just looking for the new new songwriters. They want hype, you know. So most people only want to deal with you when you have something in the pipeline. So if you have something, if you can go to them and you're like, "Hey, I'm on the new Bruno Mars album," and they know they're going to generate some money off of you. They're gonna be ready to do business with you. But are are they gonna just walk in the door? Let you walk in the door, and unless you got some relationships with somebody there who will take a chance on you, are they going to just give you a check for a co-pub deal? No, you're not going to do that. And especially right now, most new people that I see coming in, like they're, they're, they're screwing the artists over. Like I remember when I got ready to do my first publishing deal, I had somebody lay out a million dollars on the table for me to do like a 14 song deal over at one of the publishers, which if you know how the publishing breaks down, you know, yes, it would have been a cool check, but I just, I'd have never got out of that deal. Most people now they're doing like one song deals because it's like they know they're gonna get some publishing off of whatever you already got out, and hopefully you get something else out. So I hope I was able to answer your question. Like the age doesn't matter; it's all about do you have something that has something of value. Mm. Um, now let's talk about that. Sounded like you need to do a little research and have know a little about the legal part of it. It sounded mm -hmm. like you need to know about those contracts. You need to know what mm -hmm. to read in the contracts, so people need to be mm -hmm. aware of that. So Gina, thank you so much for that question. Gina belongs to a, a great band called Smooth Ivory and Smooth Ivory mm -hmm. 2. She's out of New Jersey, but she's here in North Carolina. And so mm -hmm. if any of you have a question, I appreciate you stopping by. I see uh, this young lady, D. Kwanzaa. She said, great questions, great interview. Lavelle, uh, all you people. What's up, Lavelle? That's the man right there. Yeah, so uh, you know Lavelle. Is he out the industry? Lavelle, if you want to come in and make a comment and add value to man, something. Man, Lavelle is I the man. You need to bring him in. <laughs> okay, okay. Lavelle. That's that man right there. That's that dude. Okay. That's that dude. Well, Lavelle, we, we definitely will bring you in. He said bring you in, so I'm listening. So Lavelle, send, send a request so we can come on in, and we'll bring you in for sure. But now, so let's talk about what you don't like that's happening in the industry right now. I know for me, back in the day when I used to dip and dab a little bit with Sony and stuff, there was a lot more marketing dollars out there for the new artists. There was a lot more promotional things that they did. Nowadays, mm -hmm. the labels are not giving none of that stuff right there. Mm -hmm. It's a lot tighter right now. So from where you're sitting with the... Well, the, the thing artists, is... Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, the artists have to understand now, like, 
yeah, you want to do it all on your own, but at the end of the day, producers are the new labels. We're the ones that are putting the work into an artist, developing an artist for two or three years, putting our money really into it to get it to the market where a label wants to do a deal. You know, yeah, you'll always hear stories about somebody who will, you know, get a lucky record, you know, or something going on on social media. They have, you know, it'll take off like that. But at the end of the day, if you look, most artists are already signed to a producer and they're doing they're doing the deals that way. So it, it's very tough. You know, I hate I hate that. Honestly, I hate that the gatekeepers are gone. Like people used to get mad. Remember back in the days, people be like, "Man, the labels ain't messing with nobody." Yeah, it's the reason why. Like you, you suck. You know, <laughs> they're not gonna fill it up with trash now. With the internet, it's it's so easy to just drop something and get that instant gratification. Like people are like, "Oh, I put my record out on SoundCloud," you know, so I, I got my record out, and they want to act like they're in the same level on the same level as Jay Z, or in the same room as Jay Z. And it's like, yo, you put something out on SoundCloud, you didn't create a job for anybody, you didn't do any clearances, you didn't no attorney, you know, did any work for you, anything. You just sat in your studio last night, bounced it down, and put it up. You didn't really plan out what you're gonna do, cause cause you know, I, I look. I look at the music business the same as um, if you won the lotto. Most people don't know what to do if they won the lotto. Like most people right now are walking around and they don't know. An, they don't know an accountant. They don't know what they would do if they woke up tomorrow with two hundred million dollars. And it's like I ask. I look at artists the same way. They wouldn't know what to do if they woke up tomorrow with a number one single. <laughs> no. That's that's true, Lavelle. You know, you can send a request. That's Lavelle. I want to say congratulations to you. You know, he the man here in Bobby. Mm -hmm. You know, he done his things in Central. He never met me personally. I've tried to reach out to him a couple of times because of the stuff that he does and the stuff I do. Uh, we have to mutual. Friends. Oh no, that's but Lavelle, no, that's, that's family. That's family. Yeah, right there. okay. You know, well, we, Lavelle, we... you are welcome to come in and send a request so you can join this live because we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to hear your story too because you are doing some amazing. Yeah. Have buildings up named after you and everything. So, uh, we, yeah, we he's definitely doing a lot for the community. Her. So yeah, he's doing now, a whole lot for the community. Yes, he is. He is, and and uh, so I would love to partner with him because you know I love community as well. So now, Travis, let's talk about that first nomination for Grammy. Tell me about that day. Tell me about that day. Take <laughs> us to that day when you got the call, when you found out that your music got nominated. How did that feel? Did you feel like um, oh, it's it, finally happening? It's, you know what's so crazy? That whole year was just nuts i never really even had a chance to take it all in until later because what happened was literally um october of 2007 um i literally had uh was it? i had jay holiday's album come out and then a week later jennifer lopez's album came out so it was like one week his stuff came out the next week her stuff came out and then literally a month later my daughter was born november 10th and probably two weeks after that me and me and Jay were back in the studio because since the album was doing so good, we um we started working on songs for the deluxe edition. Top of the year, you know, we had the deluxe edition come out, and we we were really back in our back in our mode working on the you know starting to work on the second album, and then by the end of the year, you know, that's when I found out that I got nominated for his album but then what was so crazy was the other nomination was just something that I didn't even expect I literally had somebody ask me to come in and engineer a gospel session that they didn't want to work so I was like okay cool I came in I was helping out with the vocals and stuff I engineered the session you know what I'm saying left and then didn't think two seconds about it next thing I know I'm like I'm nominated for a Grammy. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I'm like, what just so, happened? So you you broaden your horizon. So you did gospel, you did rap, you did R and B. So you you don't want to limit yourself. So you would <laughs> tell a music producer that starting today to don't limit yourself. Is that correct? Never that. And also, um, you know, you you gotta you gotta get your skills up. Like you can't just be a producer. Like you gotta learn how to sit in this chair, record people. There's times that you might not be the man in the room. You might just be the ear. Like you know, just go in and just engineer, push the buttons. You never know what can happen. But get it helps you learn how to make your stuff sound better. And it also just, you know, put, helps you get more work. Like in times when you're not engineer, I mean, not producing, you might get called an engineer. Like I get called an engineer all the time. It just it happens like that. And then, you know, it turns into more business. Wow. So what's coming up the pipe, man? I said we get a sneak peek. What next? <laughs> what's the next project we need to look out and listen for. 
um, just had Jay Holiday's album come out uh, on the seventh of this month. Um, putting the finishing touches on Case's album, his 25th anniversary album, and we have a 25th anniversary movie that's going to be coming with the album. So everybody needs to get ready for that. That movie is super, super dope. Um, and then um, my baby, she'll be here in April. Um, Demetra McKinney, I'm going to finish her second album. Like we're done, but you know, just going to put some more little little sauce on it once she gets here. And then I have a new group, um, Lyrics. I think people have probably seen me um, posting about them. <clears throat> they're kind of like the new Casey and JoJo. Oh, um, nice. They're brothers. Yeah, they're brothers. So I'm doing a throwback album on them. Um, the name of their album is called A Night at Natalie's. So their album sounds like all music that you would have heard on New York Undercover at Natalie's. It's, it's super, super dope. Wow. So do you um, have uh, that we could hear? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um... I think, um, matter of fact, I think I have their video posted online actually here, but I'll let you, let me see here. I can let you hear something new of theirs. Um, sorry, <clears throat> kind of dropped my phone there, but yeah, I can kind of let everybody hear the sound of their project. Um, like and I said, the, um, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Travis Cherry. He's coming in and giving you some insight on what it's like from the producer's perspective. Many artists are out here trying to be heard, trying to be seen. So we wanted mm -hmm. you to hear from someone who has been out there. He's done work with many people in the industry, from Jennifer Holiday, Bone Thug, Rick Ross, yes, hey, come Keith, everybody. Jeff Holiday, Case, Keisha Cole, Jennifer Lopez, Raheem. I mean, many, 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 many more. So we figured if you have some questions, you can ask them. You can to come through if you want to ask a question and come through the live and ask him yourself or you can hit the question in the question box and be be you know open about it if you go to the question box then i'll be able to see it or you can put it in a comment if you want to put it in a comment either way you want to do it we'll be happy to have you do that um yeah so i'll let you hear um matter of fact this is this is this is actually the title track from their album. It's called A Night at Natalie's. I would have gotten them on here with you, but they're actually doing an interview right now with another another person at the same time we're doing this. Wow. Yeah, I got them working. They they I stay on them, but this is called A Night at Natalie's. I'll let you just hear a little bit of it. But this okay. is okay. I would love to. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Travis, you mentioned something earlier. You said people need to ask the right question. Mm -hmm. What are some of the questions they need to ask when they come in the room when they're trying to get a music producer or they're just trying to get a good deal or get somebody to recognize them or get them a break? So first off, it's, it's all about your business like, and, and it's about your plan. So what ends up happening is people will just randomly find beats all over the place, go to all these different people trying to record, 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 record without ever really knowing themselves. Mm -hmm. And then when they get a chance to sit down in front of somebody, you have this, this soup, this gumbo. And it's like, I want to put this out. And it's like, from the beginning, you got to know who you are as an artist and just like plan out your project. The same way I said, Hey, their song, their album is all about songs from, you know, New York undercover. Listen, I, I don't have to search for songs. I know what, what their sound is. If you start out from there, once you get a chance to sit in front of somebody, you can say, hey, 
I did an album. These are all about songs about my grandmother. I want to get these in movies or I want to try to get this to the right artist, the right audience. Okay, now we can sit down and plan that out and say, okay, well, what you need to do is probably go here with it because it'll be stronger over here. Or let's see if we can talk to somebody over at this label because they're looking for that right there. Or maybe, hey, let me see who I know that is over here at this publishing company or maybe even at this movie company that's doing these type of TV shows that that would be that would go with. That makes my life easy. But just showing up and you just like, I just want to do music. Okay. And then what are we doing? Mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, oh, I just want to. I just want to be a star. Okay, what's a star? Because I know people that are super popular without even having music out. So, what does that do? Wow! So, wow! Did you? I oh, don't, they are on there. Do you? Who do you look up to in the industry that you kind of say, you know what? I'm going to be like them, or <laughs> all say I'm going to be myself, and you're going to create your own lane. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, matter of fact, right before I met you, 94, I met Teddy Riley. And Teddy actually took time out to give me some advice. And then right after that, um, I think the one soundtrack that still is like, it haunts me is the Wait in the Exhale soundtrack. Like, I've always wanted to be at that point, like Babyface did on that album, and be able to do all different sounds for all those different artists on one project. So... Um, if I had to say I look up to anybody, it's definitely my big bro. Like Teddy, you know, is is definitely my big bro. Um, what's what's crazy is is what's crazy is I I linked back up with him ten years later, and he couldn't. Even, he was like, I gave you advice. I was like, yeah. He couldn't even believe it. And to this day, you know, like that's still that's still a friend. You know, like still a big brother to me. Wow. You know? Now I see in the box uh, someone named L E K P underscore Don Medina. He said, Don Medina's that dude. he said to let you know that his that your producer friend Don Medina has chimed in to listen to this interview. Also, mm -hmm. you have pure, 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 you, pure, I can't even talk today. Pure <laughs> hood radio, pure hood radio. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, how you doing, Travis? It's Case. How does Case get the work done? They're all low key comedians. That's what it is. <laughs> You got, yes, that's definitely somebody that knows how our sessions are. But no, Don Medina, that's that dude, you know. Don Medina's a super dope producer. Yeah, he's, he's, he the truth. Yeah, 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 Don, Don, yeah. What up, Don? But yeah, um, as far as how me and Case work, I I don't even know. Like, that's, that's once again, that's my brother. I mean, I've been, I was at his wedding. I mean, that's somebody that's just a part of my life, regardless of the music or whatever. Like, how we even work, I don't even know sometimes. You wow, just... <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. We would love to hear your story, Don, too. Let me tell you what this is. We have a platform here where we allow people to tell their story because a lot of times people don't know the story behind the person. They know mm -hmm. you're a music producer, but they don't know how you messed up your knee and how you wanted to be a veterinarian. They don't know how this happened. You see, mm -hmm. and that's an inspiration to somebody because you just told them how they had to have a plan B. You know, so mm -hmm. sometimes we need to hear that. So, uh, mm -hmm. Travis, let me ask one question right quick, and I'm going to let you answer because I'm a caregiver for my sister, and I hear her calling me, so I'm wondering if, she, <laughs> if something's happening in there. So I want you to tell the people right now what it was like. Did you ever attend the Grammys? Did you go to the Grammys at all? And what was that like for you? I did not. I've made up in my mind, though. I said, the next time I get nominated, I'm going. <laughs> Sound like you're going uh -huh. to check on, but yeah. But yeah, no, next time, next time I get nominated, I'm definitely going. Um, I didn't. I didn't go to the first when I had nominations. I got water, y'all. So if y'all know the core people, tell them that I need an endorsement. Yeah, uh, I know but, that. I thank you so much. I know she, she needed me. I knew she needed me right there. So you've never gone to the Grammys? Nope, I'm a, I'm a voting member of the Grammys though. So I mean, I, I get you know I can get tickets every year. I just had, literally just got my email yesterday for buying tickets, but I said I'm not gonna go until I'm nominated again. You don't want to just go and and sit in the mm. room and mingle. Mm. I mean, I, same people already know. Okay, so you, uh, Naya Raspberry just joined. She's an artist. Um, she's from Raleigh, and she's another artist that I'm working on. 
So she's definitely somebody to keep in keep keep in contact with and keep watching her journey as she grows. Okay. Well, I want to tell you, Naya, make sure you, you uh, and she has follow, me, follow me yes, yes. and introduce yourself to me. If you're on this live and you have a story or you want some help with getting the word about who you are, inbox me. You can tell your story, too. I'm here for that. I used to be mm -hmm. into promotions when it comes to artists. I don't focus on artists now, but I work with some other people who do focus on artists. But I still mm -hmm. want to hear your story, though, and I still can help you tell your story. And I would love to hear your music and hear what you have going on. If Travis say you're good people, then you're good people. So Naya has Naya has a record that is definitely cold. Like her first single is, yeah. yeah. Now somebody else put in the box and, and said something. They asked, "Who has been your favorite artist to work with?" <laughs> um, sheesh. Um, hmm, I'm trying to think like who I have the most. I mean, me and Case have so much fun together. Like this is a few years of us working. Same with Jay. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I think I'm 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 still trying to figure that out. Like me and Demetria have a great time in the studio because it's just we 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 found each other at the right time. Um, so that was definitely fun, and I have a lot of fun with her. I'm trying to think, like, it's just, I mean, probably, you know what? Yeah, yeah, probably one of those. Um, um, How about the ladies? How about the Jennifers? Were they easy to work with? Did you enjoy working with Jennifer Lopez or Jennifer Holiday? J-Lo, you know, they keep a they keep a, a, a wall around her, so it wasn't like, you know, you're really going to be able to interact with her in any way. It was like, there was no real interaction. Um far as yeah like i said when it comes on the females i mean Demetria is always gonna be my queen like that's that's number one because she did so much for my career just us working together I have to i have to say that you know <laughs> so let's think, talk about I think that I let's talk see. about that let's talk about that for the music producers that want to go into this they need to know that there will be some artists that you won't really have access to you will do something mm -hmm. for them but you really will be doing it from a distance is that correct Mm -hmm. Yeah, Petway Clothing is really trying to start jokes over here. He is who Petway Clothing is who I started the music business with. So when I told you I, I messed up my ankle and everything, and you know I got with somebody who I started working with, he is the person who you know put things together. Like he, we, me and him have started this. We've been together since '93 on music stuff. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, Petway, I'd love to have you come in and tell us about that. I just invite mm -hmm. you come in and tell us about how that happened with you, because I think people need to know, and it's always good to hear another perspective. And I told mm -hmm. individuals it's about who you have in your circle. So he's mm -hmm. still in your circle today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Because it, it was, it was, it was, it, how can I say it, it? It was always about going back to the people that I started with, like, you know, no matter where I've been, no matter the journey, it was never going to be complete unless I came back to the people that I started out with. Like, you know, I would never want to leave him behind. Now, he you asked know. you a question. He said, how did you get into doing music? Yeah, he knows. <laughs> oh, he must yeah. want you to tell. He must want you to tell that story. Yeah, we're not going to tell some of those stories that he has. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he knows. So he's trying to get you to tell some of those. Secrets. Yeah, he's trying to get you to tell some of the secret stories. No. But okay. yeah. So yeah. uh Petway said he got some storage for another time, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, now now he comes from a really a really big music family right there in Raleigh. You know, like when you think of music in Raleigh, yeah, his family, they're all over the place. Like all of them sing and everything. So I want to give you the opportunity to share anything that comes to your mind and your heart. I appreciate you coming through and just sharing what it's like. Have you had anything that discouraged you ever and made you feel like you wanted to get out of this? Did it ever feel like, <clears throat> no, I don't want to do this? Or was it always like, I'm in the right place, I'm going, this is it? Um, So, so that's some of the stories that, <laughs> see, that's some of the stories like he, he wanted me to share. So I had, uh, um, I had a situation with one of our other friends who kind of screwed me over when I was, um, just I had just got out of my first production deal and I had, I had signed up for school here in Atlanta and I was taking some um, vet tech courses and 
dude kind of just really threw me over to where I didn't have a place to live or anything. And so I um, got a security job and in the security job, I was sitting at this, um, in this lobby and every day I would, um, <clears throat> you know, just work my job. I, like in the evening times I would see these people come in and they would speak to me and go to this office that was like to my left, but they had, and they had paper on the windows. So I never really knew what their business was. And so, you know, at that time, I was like, man, I just ready to quit the music business. I didn't care anymore. I was just like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And so one night this guy struck up a conversation with me and he was like, what do you do? And I was like, well, I was doing music, but I don't really want to do it anymore. I'm just focused on working and, you know, rebuilding my life and just going on to do some other stuff. And I'm trying to finish school. And dude was like, do you know what we do? And I was like, no. He was like, man, come over to my office. So I walked over to his office and walk in. They were running a record label right there. Wow. So wow. that was that moment. I was like, no matter what, it music wanted me. Wow. You know, <laughs> like so no that, matter how, I was trying to leave it. Wow. So with that being said, that makes me wonder what it is you could share with somebody about what they need to look out for. Like something mm -hmm. that maybe not like a scam, but something like a red flag. What's a red flag that you can tell somebody that they need to be looking out for when they go looking for a producer? Um, number one, ha like if somebody's charging you for something, have they generated that amount for someone else? Like if somebody comes in and they're like, oh, I'm gonna charge you 10,000 for this, for this beat. Well, have you generated 10,000 for somebody else? You know what I'm saying? Like most people just, they jump in, they go get a laptop, start downloading some samples and they want to be on the same level as Timbaland on the first day. And it's like, you've not generated any money for anybody. You've not shown what your worth is. It's like, you gonna if, if you're smart, you're going to end up giving away a lot of free stuff before you actually start really getting into big money. So I would say start there. Like don't spend money anywhere that you can't see it. You know, don't pay DJs to play your music. Cause you can't tell when they playing your music. You can't track that metric. You can track that metric on Spotify. You can track that metric on Apple music. You can't track when, DJ such and such is like, oh, man, I played your record and nobody was feeling it. Well, when did you play my record? Well, I played it as soon as I was setting up at 10 o'clock before there was even a crowd. Of course, nobody was feeling it. Was like six people in the day going to play. So don't pay the DJs. You heard what he said. Don't pay the DJs. Isn't it enough out here, enough, like you said, Spotify and all these different places, they can do it by themselves for free. If I'm going to pay a DJ, I'm coming to the club like they do here in Atlanta. Like they'll come to the strip club in Atlanta. And they'll go buy the DJ a drink and, and maybe slip him a couple bucks. I'm like, can you play my record so that you can see the crowd respond? I'm not paying no DJ, you know, a monthly fee to be a part of a record pool, you know, <laughs> when radio is waning. Like, right? radio is not as strong as it was. So we have a question for you. Uh, this question is coming from This Is One Year. It says, how hard do you train your up-and-coming artists when they work with you? Ask Naya or Lyrics. I saw they jumped on here. <laughs> you can ask any of them i'm sure they'll i'm sure any of them if they're here they'll 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 tell you how hard i am because i demand perfection so it's like if if i'm not rough on you right now you'll grow you'll you'll grow into an artist that gets sensitive every time somebody posts on your instagram page that they don't like your shirt wow <laughs> so you gotta have tough skin you better because what like like what if it takes like what if it takes me two years to get you to market? You know, like Naya was patient, like Lyrics was patient. They'll tell you the story about how long they waited. I mean, Naya was around me for at least a year before it really clicked with me what I was actually gonna do as far as a sound for her. But she was still coming to sessions, still being a sponge, still learning when the artists are there. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't about her saying, "Yo, you got to put me on right now." It was patience. It was like, "Okay, cool." I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn. That's it. So let me ask you this question. In 2022, Travis, everybody speaking with Ebonics and they talk any kind of way, they dress any kind of way. Should they come into the office looking a certain way or sounding a certain way? Or does that matter? If that's who the artist you are, yeah. You want to be that artist, you know. I mean, you want to be, you want to be who it is that you're trying to sell. So I'm not mad there. I just think that that's not necessarily what I associate myself with all the time. Yes, will I do certain? Will I work with those artists at times, from time to time? Yeah, but um, 
you uh, you have to understand that if you're following what the last 10 artists have done here in America, you're going to miss the entire world because that doesn't translate in other languages and it doesn't it doesn't translate in other places. So, so you somebody do have to be asked, smart. Somebody asked, have you ever hit a dry spot in your career and how did you bounce back? Oh, it happens all the time. Uh, lyric, the, again, lyrics, they'll tell you, Naya will tell you. There's a few, I mean, everybody will tell you, like, there may be times you come in the studio and I'm just not in a creative space. We sit and just watch TV, just chill. Just just look at someone on YouTube, just anything, until I'm just in that space where I'm like, hey, let's go. You know, there's been times that I might go three or four months and not even work on a new beat. You know, I might be, I might come in here and just lay a chord down or something like that and just keep on going. Like, I might, I'm just not really necessarily at, you know, working on anything new. But it took me to get to this point where I understood that um, there's a flow to how I got to work. So instead of me sitting here like, oh, let me do 30 beats a day. Nah, at the end of the like, like I know what I got to work on. I know when I'm in the mood to work on Naya stuff and when I'm working on lyric stuff and I'm working on Demetria, when I'm working on Case or anybody else that I work on, I know when I'm in that space. So I don't have to necessarily thoroughly doubt myself in years past when I didn't have artists that I was working on um consistently yeah it was easy to um it was easy to kind of hit a dry spot because it was like just kind of throwing stuff against the wall hoping something sticks now it's like okay I know I got to work on case I know this is when we're trying to put something out by okay cool you know or I know when I'm working on this artist this is when we're trying to put it out by okay cool so I can stay um <laughs> Are you are you currently taking new artists right now? Are you taking new people if they come to you? Or are you full? Not, not. I mean, I'll listen, but I'm 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 trying to get everybody else's stuff out. Okay. Yeah, Richard, I see what you said. Yeah, I I think they're like we we're, we're using we got to put air quotes on singers. <laughs> and somebody and said, you, "What do you think about the singers of mm -hmm. today called the today called the '90s?" I think he mean versus the '90s. I mean, producers stop stop sampling '90s records and calling it a new beat. It's still the same beat. And singers, I just think singers need to learn their craft because even if you're just an auto tune singer, you still gonna have to. If you blow up and you got a tour, you got to know how to take care of your voice. You know, and it's a different animal once you get on that stage with a live band versus just sitting in the studio with auto tune and just vibing. <laughs> yeah, I thought that's what I thought. Oh, yeah. I love the verses. I love what they're doing with the verses. Uh, mm -hmm. The old school and the new school, you know, I feel that I just enjoy the old school. There's nothing like the old school music. The new school yeah. music, to me, it doesn't have as much meaning. It's it's just, mm -hmm. it's just straight, like, they just tell you what they feel. It's like, boom. You know what I'm saying? But back in the day, they told more of a story and they, you know, they were smooth with it. Today, they rough with it. I feel like it's a little bit more rough and direct. And do you agree? The music today is a little more rough and direct. Back in the day, yeah. it was more smooth and subtle. And, and you know, back in the yeah. day, we had slow records and slow jams. And mm -hmm. now everything is just fast. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it, you know, I respect what they're doing. But I just think that they're not looking at long-term you know, the movement and actually what it is you're trying to do with the culture. Because before this music was also our voice. It was how we got information out, you know. Think about the struggles from the, the late 60s into the early 70s. Like, that was our power, you know. Now, now I'm going to limit it to, like, three more questions because I want to respect your time. Somebody asked the question, what has been your worst industry experience today? <laughs> worst industry experience today. I'm not going to say the name of the artist, but I was in the studio with a certain male singer and um, that singer, it was me, him, and one of his background singers because people had left us in the studio together. And that artist sat down beside me and I guess his background singer knew what it was. Like he literally, before he sat down, he dimmed the lights in the studio and sat down beside me and was like kind of leaning on my shoulder. And he was like, yo, man, y'all the studio's fly, man. It's on some Draper shit. It's nice. It's real nice. <laughs> You're trying and to I'm get sitting here, 
Yeah, and I'm sitting here like, did you smack him? <laughs> he wasn't a small artist. Let me just say that he 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 had done some prison time. He's a he's a popular artist, which is crazy. I'm not gonna say his name, but I just slid over. I'm like, yeah, thanks. You know, I kind of just you know dodged those advances because I was like. And his guy was laughing in the booth as he's, you know, as I'm trying to record because he knew dude was trying to flirt. And I'm sitting there like, dude, I don't get down like that. Like, I don't know what y'all got going, what y'all do in studio. That ain't, <laughs> but not that over ain't, here. That ain't that me. You said, Travis. <laughs> that ain't me, bro. Wow. That's probably, that's probably one of my craziest industry experiences that was really horrible because I didn't <laughs> know that, that I didn't know that that's how that artist got down. Somebody said, oh, hell no. <laughs> 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 so wow. so if you believe if you don't think that it still happens don't <laughs> you might not want to be in the music business because it does still happen well let me ask you for the ladies for the lady do the ladies get hit on do the ladies need to be prepared uh i would like to ask do they need to be prepared to stand their grounds because sometimes when they come out in the industry People might try to take on a direction they don't want to go. Like, if you know what you want to do and you won't do, they need to be grounded. Like, okay, this is what I want to do. I think this is what you was talking about earlier with the brand. You need to know what you want to do and what you're not going to do because they'll take you there if you let them, right? Yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. You just got to you just gotta be strong in you. What, but you know what's so crazy is when I first got in, into the business, I would say that culture was very like the, the the things that we see like the Me Too movement and stuff like that. That culture was very entrenched into this. Now with more of a drug culture and 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 the influences of the music, like I've been in sessions where I've seen like like I've been in the session where it was like twenty girls in the session and maybe five or six of us males. And they completely forgot we were there. Once the hookah came out and the alcohol came out, I was like, well, okay then. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it was, it, it, wow. it, was it, it was a porn movie going on in the studio. And I'm just sitting there like, let me get my work done and leave. Cause this is, this is something right here that I don't know that I want to be here when it wow. ends. What, so what it's Travis, a different let me culture. Ask you this before we come to a close, I want to ask you this. Super Bowl Sunday, mm -hmm. we took halftime show. The mm -hmm. music industry that was amazing. That was amazing. What what was your take about what happened? What do you think that did for the rap industry and for our culture? What do you think happened it, on Super Bowl? It put us on the biggest stage and let people see that you can have artists of you know a certain level come together without any kind of um any kind of extra stuff attached to it you know no no um drama nothing like that and it, and to me it was it was good leading up to it with all the versus battles we've had everything else like that like i think that our culture is fighting back against what's been entrenched for way too long like me and bone crusher had this conversation and it was like he was like you know this is the first time that really something has been here so long without there being a change so with all this trap music and that whole culture that's here now it's been here for so long that it's time for change and so what's been happening is all this stuff has just been reminding people of how the music is supposed to feel and how you felt when certain you know music came out and certain artists and the quality of the artists and so i think that it's making other artists step up like there's certain artists that i think I've, that i've been a fan of that i'm like they've they've they're, they're starting to rise above what you think that they are like somebody like a little baby like he's not a trap rapper anymore he I, I respect him as a rapper you know what i'm saying like somebody like that like you're just like wow like okay you're starting to see these artists look at themselves as bigger and see themselves as something that can stay stay longer than just four or five years and they're out or stay longer than one song and they're out so that to me was a perfect crown on the head of the change that we need in the music business because it reminded people of what the music is supposed to feel like you know like i um like I, you know like mace is one of my um, one of my homies that i hang with from time to time and i told dollar i was like you know we, we had a talk one time and i told him i said dude you got to understand why people stop and listen every time you do something i said you 
whole you are the you are some of the best summers that people have had in their life and the ones mm -hmm. who, who weren't there when you when you came out wow. have heard your music and they still feel good when they hear your music that's good it's, a, it's the same reason like if you're in a club right now and they play a michael jackson song and people stop what they're doing they'll be like yeah we turn up. oh wait dancing that's good. <laughs> you know that's saying? good. Like, and my last question, my last question, and thank you to those who were asking questions. I appreciate that. I appreciate you being here. And so what next? What do you think? Where can they go after that next year? What do you think they're going to do next year to come back after that? I would love to see them bring, like, something that, like, well, I would love to see them bring something that, that's just so unexpected, like bring out a boys to men. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Bring out some of the true singers and let them tear that stage up. You know, bring bring out give me give me Run DMC one more time. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Like bring yeah. bring one of them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like bring bring one of them where you just be like, man, I remember what hip hop was supposed to sound like. Like give me LL Cool J on that stage oh, one time. Oh boy, ooh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Now you're talking <laughs> LL Cool J, yeah, Jay Z. A lot of people said something about Jay Z would be dynamite out there too. Well, I mm -hmm. want to thank you so much for taking the time out and just giving us your insight on the industry and answering the question for the people and you are welcome at this time to tell them how to follow you or once again remind them about the artists you have coming up anything that you would mm -hmm. like to share that you want them to be mindful of you can tell them yeah. yep you can always keep up with me on my instagram um the real travis cherry and then um you know always if you see the hashtag the purple room you know you'll probably see a lot of people that are coming in and out of here and keep looking for the artists you know i'm always talking about the artists that are that i'm working on and just we get ready for this first this this next project this case project that's gonna be the one and after that you're gonna see everybody else that's around me well i'm gonna contact you i might need a theme song right now you know i play uh my girl kelly it's my time to shine i might need to get mm -hmm. my, own, my own theme song so i might need to give it got to you. you i appreciate you i truly do once again my name is crystal Bodie smith and you can follow me at www.iamcrystalbodysmith or you can follow me here and remember if you have a story we want to hear your story it doesn't matter if you are just coming out if you've already arrived it's okay we want to help you because it could definitely help someone else your story can help someone else whether oh no i got something before you finish too i got one before you finish one memory that i know you're gonna laugh at uh-oh uh -oh. so because people don't people don't know how long we've known each other. I'm like, so let's tell people. I, I don't, I, let's tell people about New Beyond. <laughs> oh, definitely, and, definitely. I'm wait, gonna actually, wait. I'm gonna actually, uh, it's on Facebook right now. They actually acknowledge New Beyonds for Black History Month. And actually, uh -huh. I'm going to be interviewing some people from New Beyond. You know, I've been trying to get some people to come back and do an alumni show. What he's talking about, guys, is a fashion truth that is at the campus of St. Augustine's College. And guess what I found out just recently, you know, okay, so St. Aug was one of the first troops in the area. And then after that, we kind of ignited the fire and all the HBCUs created mm -hmm. one. But I found out we were the second in the country, second modeling troop ever in the country, you know? So you I- had us, You had us in, uh, I'm like, you had us in, what was that, Jet Magazine or something like that? You had us, You we were, it was, that was an amazing experience. I was about to say, let's, Let's, well, let's you know not... what I want? I, w I want to see fashion come back. I, you know, St. Aug really is sleeping on it, and they don't understand how mm -hmm. much money they can make with that troop. They don't understand. Oh, yeah. They talk about fundraising, what mm -hmm. can take place, you know. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. that they open their eyes and they, they realize it one day. But I'm going to be actually interviewing the young lady that is over it all. Her name is Nigeria Catrice. She is so passionate. Okay. She has a group out here now, uh, and you should check out. She... There's something, they're doing some things. So they don't do that much on campus. So she does a lot in the city. She's passionate about okay. fashion. But uh, I appreciate you. you. I appreciate you remembering those days because you know what? A lot of our New Beyonce leaders are doing big things now. Tim is vice president. Yeah, Tim. Um, Maria was the interim president. I mean, Jeronica, mm -hmm. Jeronica right now is uh, one of the top leaders at Wake Med Hospital. Look at you, a two-time mm -hmm. Grammy nominee. I mean, everybody's doing amazing. So I'd like mm -hmm. to think that those skills that they got there made a mm -hmm. difference. You see what I'm saying? So uh, I feel really proud. I feel like a proud mama. I really do. <laughs> but listen, I appreciate you. I love you. I am so excited for you. When you, when you get that next Grammy nomination, let me know. And when you come here to Raleigh, you coming in two weeks? Uh, about two weeks, yeah, I'll be up there. Let me know. Let's do lunch or something, man. I'm telling you. 
And I look forward to uh, reaching out to your girl because I haven't heard from her. I want to thank everybody for coming through. I thank you so much once again. I will be doing this. I do this on Thursdays. I do this different times. Uh, I kind of pop up according to the availability sometimes. So look for more story times. And I just thank you, Travis. I thank you for not forgetting. Because a lot of people, they get here and they forget where they came from. You know, oh, they get they get the million followers, they get the 10 million followers, they get the 50,000 followers, they get the big head, and they forget where they came from. Right now, mm -hmm. I'm telling stories, right? I have actually reached out to some people. I've helped a lot of artists in their, in their days before they started. And like you, I'm not going to name names, but I done reached out to some of them. And I'm just looking like, wow, so you, you, you got the big head now, huh? I That's remember crazy. you were just getting started, and I helped take you into the classroom to talk to the students and stuff. But you mm. all that now. Mm -hmm. I okay. cannot wait. But the first one that allows me to tell that story, I'm going to blow them up so big because I don't <laughs> think you should ever forget where you came from. I just Definitely. That is like, you should never forget where you came from. Because without the people, you're nothing. Exactly. You're nothing. Well, without the people because in a drop of a hat, you could lose it just as fast as you got it. Just as fast as you got it. I don't care mm -hmm. who you are, you know. So on that note, I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, send your people. I'll be glad to share their stories. Ladies and okay. gentlemen, you heard from Travis Curry. Follow him. Follow his artists and help them to get that next Grammy. All right? Let's we do it. You, and we'll see you the next time on Storytime. Travis, I'll I love. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.